In the words of King Edward VII, Cartier is the jeweler of kings and the king of jewelry. Since its inception, Cartier has had a long list of sales to royalty, from King Edward VII of Great Britain to several members of the Spanish, Portuguese, and Russian courts. Cartier is now worth over $12 billion with an estimated yearly revenue of $6.2 billion. In this video, we'll look at the history of the Cartier luxury brand. How did a modest store become a multinational luxury business with over 300 boutiques around the world? Stay tuned. The story of Cartier begins in the 19th century. Its founder, Louis-Francois Cartier, was born in Paris in 1819. As a young man, he decided to become an apprentice to the watchmaker Adolphe Picard, whose shop was located in the Rue Montargis. Louis-Francois worked diligently and gained a lot of experience in the business. During his years working for his master, he noticed how hard Picard worked just to keep the modest business afloat. At the age of 28, Louis-Francois bought the store from Picard and took over the business in 1847. He was very determined to do better at watchmaking and dealing in quality jewelry. While on his quest to transform the business, a little bit of luck would shine on him. The impending political crisis in France would be extremely beneficial to Louis-Francois. Before the Commune government, Louis-Francois made an attempt to expand the jewelry collection of the store. Short on money, Louis-Francois would only buy the jewelry pieces that he could afford, so the business was not as smooth sailing as he had thought. By 1871, Paris changed drastically when the revolutionary government of the Paris Commune seized power from the aristocrats. Gripped with fear, the elites in the society began to flee. Due to restricted access imposed by the new government, they had no access to their money and, as such, began to sell their assets. At that time, jewelry was the easiest to sell, and Louis-Francois made sure to take advantage of this. Around this time, Louis's son, Alfred Cartier, started working with his father in order to learn the ropes of the business. Alfred was much more business savvy than his father, so he handled the purchase of the jewels. Alfred bought all of the finest jewelry that France had to offer, and did so for just a fraction of its actual worth. Since its owners were in desperate need of selling, they played into his hands. By the time the commune ended a couple of months later, the future success of Cartier was already guaranteed. France became a republic, and the economy bounced back. The Cartiers could now sell all the pieces of jewelry and wristwatches they had acquired to eager buyers. Two decades later, Cartier became the number one choice for the European elite. As the 20th century approached, Paris was more alive than ever, and that saw the emergence of competition for Cartier. Louis-Francois had retired, leaving Alfred to take total control. Fully aware of the growing competition, Alfred moved the store to Rue de la Pas, which was a more favorable location in 1898. As intended, the new location brought even greater success for Cartier. The brand had built such a good reputation that Rue de la Pas became a center for jewelry in Paris. By this time, Alfred had three sons, Louis, who was born earlier in 1875, Pierre in 1878, and Jacques in 1884. Just like Alfred did, his sons also joined the family business. In 1904, the iconic Santos de Cartier wristwatch was released. Louis-Francois died later that same year. Alfred had achieved the success he set out to achieve, but he believed there was still work to be done. He decided it was time to expand the influence and reach of Cartier by taking the business out of Paris. In order to achieve this, his sons came up with a very strategic and ambitious plan. To divide and conquer, Pierre moved to New York and opened a shop on Fifth Avenue in 1909. Jacques was sent to London, where he opened a shop on New Burlington Street. Louis the eldest stayed back in Paris to hold down the headquarters. The three brothers stayed in close contact, working together to expand the brand. Notably, the personalities of each of them would come into play to achieve their goal. The youngest, Jacques, was very sociable and knew how to nurture relationships with clients. Pierre was business-minded like his father. He knew there was great potential in the booming economy of New York, which is why he positioned himself there. Louis, on the other hand, was creative. He had the uncommon ability to predict and stay on top of the trends in the fashion and jewelry-making industry. 
Due to his perfectionism, he became the driving force of the company. He was so diligent that if any piece did not meet his standard for elegance and beauty, that piece would be discarded. Now that Cartier was international, it didn't take long to attract high and mighty clients like the Rockefellers, the Morgans, and King Edward VII, just to mention a few. King Edward was a huge fan of Cartier's. For his coronation in 1902, he ordered 27 tiaras. Later in 1904, he issued a royal warrant of appointment to Cartier. On one occasion, they referenced Cartier as the jeweler of kings and the king of jewelry. In 1917, Louis designed and released the famous Cartier tank wristwatch. The watch got its name because Louis drew inspiration for its design from the tire tracks of tanks in the First World War. In October 1925, Alfred passed away. Cartier went on to achieve more success in the decades that followed. During those years, Cartier produced the best pieces the world had ever seen. These fancy goods were made of silver, gold, and platinum. One of such pieces is the Trinity Ring, which was released in 1924. The ring signifies love, friendship, and fidelity. There was no doubt that the ring was the first of its kind, as it consisted of three bands of yellow, pink, and white gold. When designing this ring, Louis was going against the trend, but he did it anyway. In that era of arts and fancy embellishments, creating something so simple was a considerable risk that paid off. Several famous people, including Princess Diana, have been seen to wear this ring. The first piece of the iconic Tutti Frutti collection was released in 1925. This breathtaking bracelet was made with rare sapphires, rubies, and emeralds. This was followed shortly by bejeweled cigarette cases, tin openers, and even gold yo-yos and toothpicks. In 1942, Pierre was left to run the company alone after losing his two brothers. Louis and Jacques died within months of each other at the age of 67 and 58, respectively. Despite the tragic loss, Pierre would continue the family legacy. With the help of Jean Toussaint, who had always worked closely with Louis, Pierre would introduce the panther motif. Cartier advertisements would include a panther moving in the streets or peering through shop windows from that time. The panther was also included as a design on vanity boxes and cases for cigarettes, bracelets, necklaces, and brooches. After successfully running the company alone for over two decades, Pierre died in 1964. After his death, the heirs of Cartier sold each of the branches to different owners. The branches in New York and London were separated from the main group, leaving the headquarters in Paris with just three stores in Geneva, Hong Kong, and Munich. Although the Cartier brand would remain a giant in the industry, it no longer belonged to the Cartier family. This would change in 1972, when Robert Hock, a French resistance hero from the Second World War, began to buy all the Cartier branches one by one. Cartier was whole again. Cartier was relaunched as Cartier Monde, and Robert served as its chairman. The following year saw the launch of Le Mousse de Cartier, which translates as, you must buy a Cartier. This release was a line of very affordable products that meant that not only the wealthy and famous could own a Cartier product. Everybody was buying Cartier, and sales went through the roof as intended. However, Robert would not live to witness much of this success as he died later in 1979 at the age of 60. He was immediately succeeded by his daughter, Natalie Hock. By 1982, Alan Dominique Perrin would replace her as chairman with Micheline Canoy as head of jewelry design. Her first collection, Nouvelle Jewelry, was launched in the same year. In 1984, Perrin founded the Cartier Foundation, Foundation Cartier pour l'art contemporain. In 1991, Perrin founded an international committee, Comité international de la haute horlogerie. The first salon of the committee was held on the 15th of April 1991 and has been an annual event ever since. Perrin would continue to hold such exhibitions for Cartier. Through the Richmond Group in 2012, Cartier was acquired by the Rupert family of South Africa and Elle Pagels, a 24-year-old granddaughter of Pierre Cartier. Today, Cartier is known for its breathtaking designs, one-of-a-kind gems, and exquisitely detailed craftsmanship. From humble beginnings in 1847, Louis-Francois's grandsons had expanded the business beyond his wildest dreams, and up until today, his legacy still lives on.